Welcome everybody to our second edition of Standard Talks on behalf of President Richard Karsten and Archbishop Malloy High School. We would like to welcome you to the Standard Talk series. We would like to thank Mike Baxter, class of 2002, for taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us tonight. Um, it's kind of in a busy time in Mike's life. I believe it's the middle of college baseball season and Vanderbilt's kind of important. Um, this is, as I said before, this is the second installment of the Standard Talks. The Standard Talks series is designed to have our amazing alumni offer us insight and perspective into their very interesting careers. My name is Matt Rosati. I'm the Alumni Development Officer here at Malloy. In my former career, and as I said the last time, many pounds ago, I was a professional baseball player like Mike. I did not happen to make it to the big leagues, but I'm happy to know a few people who did. Mike is a great guy, a true stanner, and we're very excited to have him with us tonight. A quick rundown of the night. We're just gonna have Mike say a quick hello, and we're gonna dive right into general discussion and questions. We will conclude the night with some questions that you, the viewers had submitted. <clears throat> if during the event, a question pops into your head that you wanna ask Mike, please submit it in the chat box and we'll try our best to get to it. No guarantees though. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and start. Mike, thanks for being with us. And uh, we're, very happy. we're very excited. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it, man. It's, uh, it's good to get on with all you guys. Appreciate everybody coming on tonight as well. It's uh, really, uh, really cool that everybody wants to come on and talk some baseball. And like Matt said, if you guys have any questions about whatever, just uh, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. I got nowhere to be. Absolutely. I think they really just wanted to sign on and see two bald guys have a conversation. <laughs> um, so, uh, Mike, let's, we're, we're going to cut out just, just where you grew up. I mean, obviously we, we, we know the, we know where you grew up in, in Queens, but what made you choose Malloy? You know, what made you choose Malloy high school? You know, when I was a kid, it was, it was coach Curran, honestly. Um, you know, that's where it started for me in, in the nineties. Um, Malloy won a city title every even year, I think. So 92, 94, the whole way through. And I just remember obviously when I was a little kid, I just loved baseball and I wanted to win a city championship. That's all I wanted to do. So, um, you know, my parents, uh, they kind of helped me, they helped me believe I could play there and, and kind of uh, push me in that direction. And uh, I'm very grateful I made that choice. But um, a lot of it was going to coaches camps back in the day and, um, you know, just wanting to be part of that environment. And that's what really drew me to the school. Awesome. Now, question, did you happen to win a city championship when you were at Malai? I mean, I'm fast forwarding. You said it. Did you happen to win a city championship? Last time I checked, I think it was the last one that was won, if I'm not mistaken, Matt. Would you, were you on that team? I think I was, if my yeah. memory serves me correctly. Yeah. I remember we had a big dude at first. Uh, That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, in your words, I mean, obviously I, I can share stories, but people are not here for me. Uh, how was it playing for Coach Curran? It was, it was great, man. I mean, it was, you know, I know we were joking earlier about your favorite memory of Coach and things. It, it's just – it was just more of like the experience of being around him every day, you know, um, the, the, the one liners, um, you know, the simplicity of him as a, as a coach and how powerful that is. And now being a coach for four or five years, um, it's pretty amazing, you know, to reflect on his style of coaching and recognize, um, really how good of a coach he was and how simple he was able to make his messaging. And, and that's why it was so, so successful. You know, I think people get lost in the weeds a lot when they're leaders and they're teachers. Um, and I think what coach Curran did a good job of was he was very direct. He was very honest. Uh, he was very empathetic. He was very loving. Um, but he would, he would never miss an opportunity to help a young man, uh, whether it was on the field or off the field. And, um, I took a lot from him. Awesome. Awesome. Now, just a quick question, because we're going to get there later. Growing up, were you a fan of the Mets or the Yankees? Mets, the whole way. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So uh, after Malloy, where did you go to college? I went to Columbia um, in, in Manhattan first. I went there for one year. And then uh, I transferred to Vanderbilt um, for a couple of years. And then I signed as a junior. So I came back to Vandy and finished my degree. 
um, probably four or five years into my career. And um, I've kind of made Tennessee home. So I've been living in Nashville since 2005, um, kind of full time. And um, when I was playing for the Mets, obviously I'd be up there for the spring, but Nashville has kind of become home for us, uh, my, my family and I down here. That's great. That's great. Now, just to, just to dive a little deeper, um, you know, a lot of people, one of the things that we say is that just to offer some insight. So obviously you said you went to Columbia and then you, you transferred to Vanderbilt. How did that process happen? Because I'm sure there are a lot of like um, younger high school players that are on here. How did that process happen? How did you, you went to Columbia and how did you go to Vanderbilt? Well, um, the process of going to Vanderbilt kind of came through a mutual connection with um, our head coach here, Corbin, and um, an old summer coach of mine. And, and mm -hmm. um, usually that's how a lot of that stuff will work. Um, you know, the idea of starting at Columbia, um, that was probably more just being a little bit lightly recruited out of high school, you know, and not having a ton of options now, you know, and when I say a ton of options, I think every kid, if there's any high school player on this, um, you know, being from New York, I think we all grew up dreaming about playing in Florida and LSU, right? You know, if you're playing ball, you want to play at that level. Um, I just didn't have those options out of high school, you know. So I made a choice. Um, I wanted to make sure I got the best degree possible. And that's really why I chose Columbia, because I knew there was no way I should have gotten to that school if I couldn't, you know, without baseball. So I wanted to make sure I took advantage of that and uh, went there first. And then, you know, while I was there, um, the baseball experience was good, but you know, a lot of those guys that they went out and got internships in the summer and I wanted to play in Cape Cod, you know, I wanted to play. So um, the baseball aspect was just a little bit behind for me. And, you know, I was very fortunate. I think when I jumped over to Vanderbilt, it was much different than where, where it is today. You know, that program, um, they were just really kind of restarting. Um, it wasn't quite the national level program it is now. So the timing was right. Um, you know, we didn't even have a full roster. So I think if, you know, when you're talking to players and wondering how to make that stuff happen, man, it's, it's just, you know, the journey of baseball. And you probably hear me say it a few times tonight. It's just always be present where your feet are, you know, don't get caught up and feeling like, you know, you set a goal for yourself and you need this and all right, well, if it didn't happen, then, you know, I'm going to give up or, you know, I'm just going to act, you know, upset and frustrated. You just go do the best you can wherever you're at. And, this game will take care of you. Absolutely. Now, just to be clear and just to clear things up for everybody, you so you left an Ivy League school to play baseball. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well done, like a true baseball player would. Well done. Yeah. Well done. One of my professors, I, I had to get my uh, application. I had to get a letter of recommendation from um, this professor. He, he was a a lawyer and he was teaching this class literature humanities at columbia everybody had to take it and i remember getting lunch with him and i was saying hey you know i'm going to transfer uh would, would you mind i thought we had a good relationship would you would you write me this letter of rec and he goes uh, no there's no, no chance i'm writing you a letter of recommendation you're making the biggest mistake of your life and i'm not going to support it and I, I just remember looking at him like geez wow that's a that, that's a bit aggressive you know I, I, it's not like i'm just uh going to the local community college, you know, Vanderbilt's a decent school, you know, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was inside that circle. I think uh, some people were like, you really shouldn't do it, but it was just a better balance. That's, that's really what it was. We got to play in the sec. And, and for me, that was something, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to work out, but I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to wonder what it would have been like if I never did it. Of course. I think you made the right choice. Well, yeah. I appreciate it. Did you yeah. play baseball for Columbia? I did. Yeah. One year, 2003. Awesome. Um, so, um, sorry. So you went to Vanderbilt. Obviously, you played. So draft time comes around. How does that process go for you? You know, that, that was kind of fast. Um, I, I was not a, a very – touted prospect um, I had a very, very good junior year um, and then I think it just kind of I picked up some steam towards the end of that season and um, you know uh, really I only communicated with a few scouts prior to the draft uh, very informal um, there wasn't much to it but um, you know so my phone started ringing and uh, on the draft day and um, you know I, I ended up getting picked by the Padres um, so uh, you know for me um, 
that was a dream come true. Uh, I think being a kid from Queens, you know, I probably should have had bigger goals of being a big leaguer, but I just wanted to get drafted, you know, and play pro ball. I don't know why that was the goal, but uh, it was probably a little short-sighted when I was a kid, but um, you know, when that moment came, it was, it was pretty incredible. That's awesome. Now, just because I, 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 as I said, I have some insight myself. Did you get to do any workouts before you got drafted at any big league parks? No, no, I didn't. Um, we, we were playing, we went in, our season had finished probably, you know, a week before the draft. So I just went right home um, to New York and uh, I ended up going up to Cape Cod. I played, you know, three or four weeks up there before I signed. So, uh, but no, I, I didn't do any workouts or anything like that. Got it. Got it. Just to be clear for everybody that's uh, that's viewing tonight, sometimes before, before uh, the draft, major league teams invite prospects to come and do workouts, whether it be at their minor league facilities, uh, kind of closest to the player or at their big league ballpark. So before you get drafted, you have a chance to actually, you know, take batting practice, field ground balls, hit fly balls and so on at a big league park. So that's what, that's what I was asking Mike about. Um, all right. So you get drafted. How was your time in the minor leagues? Just, just overall in general. Yeah. Um, you know, I probably wasn't ready to be honest with you. I was just talking with Corbin our coach about that yesterday. Um, you know, we're talking about our high school kids coming in and uh, the importance of going to school. And, you know, I, I signed as a junior and I was only 20 years old and, um, you know, I got off to a very slow start. I didn't hit very well um, in a ball and um, the Padres kind of, you know, they stuck with me to some degree, um, but uh, I got off the prospect path pretty quick. Um, you know, it, it took me five full years to get to the big leagues. Um, and uh, I eventually got there, but you know, the, the minor leagues, man, it's not for the faint of heart, um, you know, and, and I think you, you need to be very um, mentally prepared before you start that journey, um, you know, because, um, you know, the, the scouts will come in and they'll sell you Yankee stadium, but you're really buying the Gulf coast league, you know? So it's, um, it's a little bit different than what people expect. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. I always tell people, you know, it, it, it's gotta be a different experience now to be a minor leaguer that when you and I played, I mean, you were just a few years before I was, but when you and I played, I always give the evolution. Like when I was on a bus, I read a book, like a physical copy of a book. Right. Then the then the Kindle came out yeah. and then iPhones and like the internet on your phone came out like towards the end of our, well, towards the end of my time, which was, you know, 2010, 2011, that time. I mean, it was really still kind of new, but that was, that was old school riding on a bus everywhere, reading a book to keep yourself busy or playing cards, but yeah, yeah. one or the other, you know, you're right. A little, little different, little different nowadays. <laughs> For sure. Um, what was the best or what was your best experience playing in the minors or, you know, maybe some guys you played against, you know, some friendships you made, um, just a cool place you played? Yeah, I think the early minors are, you know, it's almost like a college in a way. You know, I, I think when you look back at, you know, or I shouldn't say, you know, when I look back at my career, you know, you look at the high school first and you say, yeah, that that experience, you know, winning that championship with you and, and like, out of all, you know, I played for a long time. That's still in the top two or three memories. You know, you just get these pockets of time and these people that you're with that are so special. And you know, the, the thing about it is you could take it for granted in that moment because you always think there's something more, you know, you always think there's something next. And if you get a chance to play in the big leagues or you get a chance to do different things, you know, different careers, you quickly realize that it's the journey that's the best part. You know, it's not always the end goal. And I think that's something that uh, a lot of people they're always looking to and thinking it's about, you know, getting to the big leagues. It's not, you know, it's really about the journey there. Um, you know, so the high school experience, the college experience was amazing. Obviously you can see the impact that had on my life and, you know, how I've decided to try to, you know, give back to that space now as a professional, as a coach, um, because of how unique that time is. And I've always been drawn to that side of the game, you know, so, uh, the minor leagues, you know, um, they were fine. They, they were good. But I think once you get into that world, you kind of realize like, all right, we're running our own race. You know, we have a uniform on, we're disguised as a team, but it's a pretty individual game here, you know, um, and we're all just trying to get to the big leagues. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's funny. I remember uh, when I played, 
what that, or I should say now, when people ask me, uh, you know, what do you miss? Do you, do you miss it? Do you miss playing? Do you miss doing this? Do you miss the minors? You know, uh, I would always say the one thing I miss is, is the camaraderie. It's just right. the guys, you know, yeah. not even the locker room, but just the, those friendships you had with your teammates, because as you just said, it's every man for himself, but that's on the field when it's off, when you're off the field, yeah, you need friends to be in, in a random spot. Like, you know, when you're, when you're randomly placed in Midland, Texas <laughs> and you're from New York, you know, you need, you, you need people that you're familiar with to, for sure. to really help pass the time. Yeah. No doubt. So, um, okay. So when let's, I guess, let's talk about this. You get the call to the big leagues. How did that happen? Um, and where were you, I should say? Yeah, I was in Portland, um, AAA Portland. And uh, it was 2010. So San Diego, they were having a good year that year. And um, they were on a bad slide, though. They, were, they lost like eight or nine in a row. And uh, we had one more day left in our season. So we had finished a day game in Portland. And our manager, um, Terry Kennedy, uh, he was a good big leaguer. Um, but he was our manager in AAA. And um, we were very, very close. We had a good relationship. And um, I, I was sitting there. We had a square clubhouse. And um, I was sitting there. And, and he just walked in. And he goes, everybody just sit down, which is unique. You know, there's not a lot of meetings in pro baseball. So he's like, I need everybody to sit down. Just sit down and listen up. And we're just thinking, whatever, you know, season's winding down. It's over. He's doing logistics. And he just looked at me and he goes, Bax, you're going to the show. And I was like, <laughs> what? You know, out of nowhere, uh, just straight away, no office, just right in front of the group. And um, I mean, I'm a softie, so I started crying, you know, because um, I, I was just too emotional. But it was a, an incredible moment, man, you know, um, for all those reasons. Like we were talking about earlier, just um, it's a long, long road. Um, you know, you dream about it. You hope, you, you know, you trust you're going to get there. I think to, to get there, you got to at some point, you got to know you're going to get there. Um, but obviously, you, you never made that decision. Somebody's got to give it to you, you know. So um, that was an amazing moment. And then being able to call you know, my wife and my family, um, my parents and share the news with them. Um, just amazing. You know, you talk about great baseball experiences. It's obviously in those top, you know, three or four. Of course. You know, it's funny. I'm pretty sure every minor leaguer, whether they can cash it in or not, has dreamt up that scenario in their mind and how it's going to play out when they call their parents. <laughs> you know, I had it all in my mind, like, hey, this is yeah. what I'm doing. If I ever get the, if I ever get to make that call to my parents, this is what I'm doing. So it's, I never got the chance. Um, but at least I'm happy. I'm happy that you did. And I'm sure your father, your father and mother were very excited. Yeah. Anybody on this call that knows my parents, they, they know my dad was pretty happy. So of course. <laughs> um, all right. So did you, when you get called up, did you meet them on the road? Did you meet them at San Diego? I met them in San Diego. Um, yeah, I met him in San Diego and uh, Buddy Black was the manager and he called me in the office and, and uh, you know, he said we, Tim Stoffer was pitching and he was coming back from a rehab assignment. So he was only going to go four innings. And uh, the manager, Bud, Buddy Black, was just like, I'm going to get you in. You're going to pinch hit, you know, right away for Stoffer. Whenever that time comes in the fourth, it's you. So just be ready. And I was like, oh, great. You know, that's the best thing a manager can do is throw you in the game just to get your feet under you, you know. So I went up and faced Vincente Padilla. He was a pitcher for the Dodgers. And, um, you know, at that time, he was probably 35 and old veteran. And I came up with first and third, runners of first and third. And um, I stepped in the box. I felt like a million bucks, man. I was like, yeah, this is right where I'm supposed to be right now. So he first and third, he takes the mound. He gets to the set. He throws a ball. He throws me a 59-mile-an-hour EFIS fastball. Just lays it up in there. And this thing is floating, man. It's like a balloon coming in. And I remember this ball comes out of his hand. And I'm like, I'm going to hit a home run. And I take the biggest <laughs> swing. And I pop up to the second baseman. <laughs> That's perfect. The perfect Major League debut. That's it. One pitch, 58 miles an hour. Runner at third, less than two outs. F F four. See ya. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's what that's awesome. Um, so 
just to die, as I said, at the end of it, we're going to dive into some questions that were submitted by everybody else uh, that were submitted by the viewers and those who signed up. But just just to, just to fast forward a little bit, your time in San Diego, do you, do you have anybody, you know, any teammates that um, that, you know, you, you really, you know, formed a good bond with or just um, some pitchers or whoever you face that you're just like, all right, this guy's this guy's the real deal. We'll get to the Mets in a bit. Yeah, you know, it was more the minor league guys, um, gotcha. you know, that, that draft class. So it was funny. I don't know, you know, if you saw or any, anybody on the call, um, this guy, Sean Kazmar, uh, he was kind of a story this week in the big leagues. Um, Sean and I came up together and um, played a lot of minor league ball together. And he actually got up to San Diego in 2008 for like 10 games and then never got back. Um, but he's played since um, he got called up by the Braves two days ago. So right. He's 36. It's amazing. Um, you know, uh, Will Venable is the bench coach now for the, uh, for the Red Sox. And we were roommates and very, very good friends. And, um, you know, Chris Young, the GM for the, the, the Tiger, or excuse me, for the Rangers now. And we all kind of came up together and played together in San Diego. So um, there, there's a lot of, a lot of good friendships that came, you know, from that initial kind of group of guys that worked their way up together. Awesome. Okay, so you're in San Diego. You get traded to the Mets. How does that go? Yeah, I got um, outrighted, so mm -hmm. basically released. Um, I got hurt in camp, so I debuted in 10. And then 2011, I was in camp with them um, trying to make the team. And I dove for a ball in Tempe, and uh, I, I tore a ligament in my thumb, so I had to have surgery. So um, I missed the first, uh, you know, two months of the year and I was on a rehab assignment in, uh, Lake Elsinore. And I, I got a call that, um, uh, that I got picked up by the Mets. So, um, that was wild, you know, obviously bittersweet to some degree, um, because, you know, it meant that San Diego was letting me go. Um, and I've been with that organization for, uh, at that point, six years. Um, but not very bitter, um, when you hear about the Mets on the other side of that kind of that sentence, you know, cause I said, well, this is, uh, this is pretty wild. All right. So the Mets claimed me and uh, I was on a red eye flight that night to St. Lucie and uh, took a physical and my wife, uh, she was stuck in Southern California with uh, our dog and our Jeep. <laughs> so she packed it up, drove cross country back to Nashville. And uh, you know, I, I kind of went out to St. Lucie, played a couple games there and then, um, went up to uh, uh, Buffalo for a few games. And then um, I think three guys got hurt on one day. I think Reyes right. And somebody else got hurt. And, uh, and then I ended up getting called up, which was wild, you know? So you're saying the Met, the Mets bad, historically bad luck benefited you. Oh yeah. Uh, for Perfect. sure. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so just a quick, uh, just some insight, you know, as I said, one of the, one of the things about this is just providing some more insight that, that, um, that the normal person cannot read in the paper. So before we get into the, the, the details of the Mets and all, and your time there, how is travel in the big leagues? How does it work? So if, if, if the Mets are traveling or big league teams traveling, do you guys just walk in the front door at, at LaGuardia and just kind of hop on a flight? How does that work? Yeah, they, they got it boxed out pretty good. You know, we'll um, we'll take the bus out onto the tarmac and, um, you know, we'll, we'll fly out of the private side of the airports and um, they take care of you. You know, they do. I would say from a experience standpoint, probably the, the travel is really what brings the big league teams together. I think, uh, you know, guys are enjoying their time on the plane. And, you know, obviously I think, you know, most, not most, now the league is young now, but uh, a lot of guys have uh, family, you know, so when you're home, they, you don't really socialize as much. Uh, you, you're kind of hanging out at the ballpark. You go home, you see your family, you do everything. But on the road, um, you know, you, you spend more time together as a group. It's more of a team dynamic. So uh, the travel is definitely uh, very enjoyable um, and it's, it's definitely first class. They, they do it right. You, you don't have to wait in the, you know, the TSA checkpoints by any means. Gotcha. Now, what about hotels on the road? How did that work? Did you guys, did you guys, what did you, what, what are, what are the, some of the hotels you stayed at? Did you stay in the Holiday Inn Express? No, <laughs> no, that was, that was nice. Yeah. They, they took care of us, man. It's, it's, uh, it is what it's cracked up to be, you know, from awesome. a, a luxury standpoint. It was, 
it was pretty, it was a pretty special, uh, pretty special time. Gotcha. Now, big league meal money, is that a thing? Or is that just a spring tra- That is that just in spring training where you got paid, you know, to be on the road, you got some meal money on the road? Uh, no, that, that, yeah, we, we got a per diem. Um, they've actually, uh, they, they've lowered it significantly in the last, uh, I think three years with the, the new collective bargaining agreement, but um, yeah, it, it was, uh, you, you would get a per diem, but you would pay dues to the clubhouse. So when right. you show up to the clubhouse, it was pretty much 60 bucks just to walk in the door um, every day. So, you know, some of your, your per diem would go there. Um, but uh, a lot of times the older players would kind of take care of the younger guys. There's a lot of that inside of that game, you know, with seniority and mm-hmm. um, some of the bigger contract guys taking care of the younger guys. So um, it, it is a, it's a unique space that way. It's, it's pretty neat that way. Absolutely. Now, just to be clear, everybody to clarify dues in a, um, in a clubhouse, what Mike's talking about is as you're, if you're a visiting player, even in the big leagues, minor leagues, you have to pay dues to the clubhouse because they provide you with food. They provide you with a whole bunch of, you know, drinks, all these different items and that, you know, it, you actually have to pay for it. So even as a big leaguer, you have to fork over some money on the road, you know, to be taken care of in the clubhouse. Yeah. But they do it right. It was nice. Yeah. yeah as much as I hate the Yankees, I'll tell you the Yankees, they, they took care of you. Right. Well, 26 championships. Come on. <laughs> um, now, one of the things that people talk about sometimes that they want to ask about is, is kangaroo court. Did you, did you take part in that? Did the Mets have it? Did the Padres have that? I'll explain people what that is. Um, kangaroo court is kind of like a, uh, I guess a check system for, for players. Players kind of like write, write each other up when they make, you know, like a silly mistake or they commit like, you know, a foul as, as far as baseball terms is concerned. Uh, just curious if, if any of the big league teams you played on had that. Not in the big leagues. Um, you know, uh, there was definitely some minor league teams did it. Um, you know, we did it at Bandy um, back in the day. Um, I would say in the big leagues, those transgressions would get aired on the bus more than they would in the kangaroo court, you know. So a lot of times uh, when you when you land and you get on the bus to go to the hotel, um, that's where the rookies would, would get up front and, uh, you know, story time or song time, you know. So a, a lot of that would kind of get hashed out on the bus. Right. Awesome. Now, just to correct myself, because I got three text messages in the time I said 26 world championships, the Yankees, it's 27. My mistake, everybody. All right. My mistake. Um, Now, I think one of the one of the bigger things that everyone is the topic we had questions submitted is to talk about the catch. All right. So during that amazing game where Santana was pitching a no hitter. Um, Mike had an amazing catch, which I am going to take a brief pause. I'm going to share my screen and show everybody the video. So just give me one sec. And Mike, I apologize in advance because this is a video of you hurting yourself and I'm sorry. coming to Molina, and a fly ball deep left field. Back goes Baxter onto the track. He makes the catch! What a play! And Baxter may be hurt, but he hangs onto the baseball. The umpire is coming out there, and he just now singles out because Baxter has not yet shown the ball, but he is shaken up after hitting the fence. I think he hit his shoulder pretty hard here, obviously. He crashes into this wall. Yep. Yep. Head and shoulder, perhaps. But in any event, Baxter makes a wonderful catch to keep the no-hit bit intact. What a play. Selling out for this play is Baxter. Well, he knew what was at stake, and this stop it right there. <laughs> Sorry, bad timing. Um, so, tell us about that. I mean, obviously, if you if you're if you're a diehard Mets fan, everybody remembers that. Um, what was that game like? What was that catch like? I mean, can you just walk us through it? The game was sloppy. You know, um, it wasn't your traditional no hitter. Um, Sorry. Yo, uh, Johan, he was he was kind of erratic. Uh, he had four or five walks, so 
you know, it wasn't one of those games, you know, we've been part of no hitters on occasion. And sometimes you get a sense that, you know, this guy's locked in. And this was a little bit of more of a, a messy one where, you know, you look up in the fifth and you not even realize it, you know. So um, that play happened in the seventh. Uh, and that's usually that point in time when you're in a no hitter where it starts to kind of get somewhat real, but it's not quite like, pressure packed yet you know the ninth is when you're kind of shaking like a leaf out there like you know you got to make a play um the seventh you know you kind of feel the energy now you can feel it in the stadium the the, the, the crowd knew for sure um you know and, and there was definitely some electricity in the stadium but it was still kind of that sweet spot in the game where um you didn't feel you, you know you, you still had quite a long way to go so uh yeah yadi hit that ball pretty good um off the bat and um you know i got an okay read on it and uh, you, you know, out there in the outfield, you know, balls that are going to be homers and then, you know, balls you can't catch. That was a ball that should be caught. Uh, and you take a read on it. And really, I just, uh, I kind of tripped at the end. I think more than anything that um, like I just couldn't brace for the while. I kind of stumbled a little bit and um, just couldn't take any energy off that. So I uh, ran into it and, um, you know, kind of knew I was, I didn't know what I had heard, but knew I was injured um, kind of, you know, right away. Gotcha. Now, what, what did you injure exactly? Um, so the, uh, I uh, separated my clavicle in, in my sternum and then uh, fractured the top three ribs um, where they connect to like this sternum. So just kind of like a straight line right here uh, mm -hmm. on the right side of my body, even though I hit on the left side. So it was kind of like I went in and you know, the, the energy from it just kind of like went through the right, you know, right side of my core. Um, anyway, it just took a little while to figure out what it was, uh, you know, because uh, it was, uh, you know, a strained injury. Absolutely. Now, I have to touch on it because it was submitted about a thousand times. For saving is no hitter, did, did, did Johan, you know, give you something? The, uh, the unwritten rule in the, in the big leagues, did he take care of you? Did he do something? You know, it, it ended up, no, um, but partly for this, when I got hurt, you know, when you get hurt in the big leagues, you just kind of disappear, you know? Um, so I was around for, you know, four or five days. And then uh, when the team hit the road, I went down to St. Lucie and, and started like a rehab. Um, Johan would pitch once or twice more and then Johan got hurt. So I don't think, I don't think we played another game together as Mets um, because he started you know, I think he did his Achilles after that. He might have had another shoulder. So um, we never really, you know, it wasn't like we ran out of string together and we were on the same team. So um, it just didn't connect that way. Man. No, we, we didn't. And, and uh, you know, but we do have uh, a, a cool, I mean, the memory is, is pretty cool. That's awesome. Now, um, touching on your Mets career, same thing, as I said before, for the Padres. I mean, is there any teammates i mean how was it playing at city field being in your hometown you know playing in front of your parents i remember actually and this is a true story i went to a game that mike was playing and i actually somehow got your attention yeah. when you were playing right field <laughs> you know you don't you may not remember it you I may not it. i would but i saw because and it was it was just at a at a just like it was just pure fate the kid that was working i guess like the the front row of that section happened to be a Malloy graduate in my class. He let me down there just so I could scream at you and get your attention. <laughs> and yeah. I did. That's what's cool, man. That's what's cool about playing for the Mets. You know, it's like I said it earlier, like, you know, this game will take care of you. You know, it will give you fulfillment. It doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, a great big leaguer and free agent, and multimillionaire. It's not about that. It's about the fulfillment of it, you know. And I think if you treat the game right, you, you walk away fulfilled and, you know, for me, it was like playing for the Mets. You know, you look at sports in general, and it's so rare to to share, you know, that career or those experiences with your family, you know, and in your community and, and the place where you grew up, you know, um, it's so rare. Um, so I never took that for granted. And I always recognized how unique it was. Um, and, you know, to have a little piece of history with the Mets is it's, it's special, you know, um, and I'm very grateful. I'm grateful to the organization for, you know, really, you know, giving me three years of time. Um, that's, that was, that was amazing. And, and um, by far the, the best parts of my career. Um, I, I look back fondly at my time with the Mets. For curiosity purposes, how long was your ride from your, from your, the house you grew up in to 
Chase uh, to City Field. Oh, that was five minutes, man. Yeah, super close. Yeah, we were in Whitestone, and um, I mean, it's just five minutes away. So my mom would drop me off my first year. She dropped me off at the field. My dad would take me home like I was going to Malloy. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Imagine as a parent dropping your son off to a big league game so they can play. That's awesome. Um, any, uh, as your time as a Met, any pitchers you faced? Any, you know, any guys that you thought were, you know, unbe- again, as they said with the Padres, unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, Terry Collins let me hit against Chapman one night and I thought he was out of his mind. I don't know what he was thinking about. Uh, you know, I, I was walking up to go hit off of Raldis Chapman left on left pinch hit I'm like Terry what in God's name are we doing here like this is not a good matchup you know um but yeah Aroldis was a beast and you know before he died Jose Fernandez was going to be an incredible talent he was uh, a young superstar um you know I got Roy Halladay on the back end of his career Roy was amazing um you know he was fantastic um you know Zach Greinke he's still going you know you look at some of these guys you look at Justin Turner I mean look at what Justin Turner we, we were great friends in New York, you know, and um, you look at how he, you know, reinvented himself as a player. It's, it's a testament to, um, you know, the, the brilliance of some of these guys to be able to stick around in that league for 10, 15, 20 years and, and you know, have different versions of themselves. It's, it's a very difficult league to do that. In. Absolutely. You know, just to share about Roy Halladay, I mean, obviously, because I was with the Phillies, when, when we were in, um, in minor league camp, you know, spring training, Obviously, just like most of the, the, the teams, right next door was the big league camp. And uh, I would show up at about 7 or 7.30, and Roy Halladay would be running what they called complexes, which is they would, he would run the outfields of all the fields because they were all connected. At 7.30, he'd be, he would finish his run at 8 o'clock, and it would be three hours. So he was there at 5 in the morning to do it. And this is no joke. This is no exaggeration. He would do a three-hour run. In fact, he would get there so early, they just gave him the keys because no trainers wanted to be there that early. And he would be done with his day before everybody came. Yeah. Like those were his off days, you know, the days he wasn't pitching. Yeah. They, he would be done with his day before everybody came. And I, I just used to call the guy a machine. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm a Hall of Famer. The guy's a beast, you know. Yep. But yeah, that's what it takes, man. You know, I mean, to, to that level of, uh, of elite, you know, those guys, they're just, they're, uh, they're pretty incredible. How'd you do against Chapman in that at bat? Three, three and two strikeout looking. I was pissed. You know, I fouled a ball off. I took a hellacious three one hack and fouled one off. And then I went down looking. So at least you, at least you touched one. Yeah. I got I got to live with that forever. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, after your time with the Mets, right. How, what is, what is your career? Um, how does it go after that? Uh, bounce around. Um, I was on a deal with, uh, with the Dodgers. Um, the Mets released me and the Dodgers claimed me. Um, so, um, so Turner and I actually went to LA that same year and I was on a major league contract and Turner was on a minor league contract and now I'm coaching and, you know, he's hitting 35 home runs a year. So, you know, shows, uh, that they, they, they found the diamond in the rough on the minor league deal that man, that was, that was a big one. So I went to the Dodgers for a year, um, I was up and down with them. I didn't get a ton of time with them. Um, and then I split a year up and down with uh, the Cubs in 15. And then in 16, um, I signed with the Mariners. I played one year with them and I got hurt. I got hit with a pitch um, in June and I broke my, I broke my wrist. And, um, you know, it's funny. I saw the x-ray at the, at the emergency room that night. And the second I saw it, I kind of, I kind of knew it was over. Uh, I just, I was 32 and um, Diana was pregnant with our second child. And, um, I just knew my time was up, you know? So at the end of that year, um, you know, I kind of worked out that off season, but I, I kind of set a, a pretty high bar for what it would take for me to sign another contract and no team was willing to give it. So, uh, you know, I just decided to move on. And what did you move on to? I, uh, I did a, I, I took a job with the Blue Jays in the front office for a year. Uh, I had a, an old teammate of mine. He's a farm director. And, um, he, he got me in there and I went down to spring training with them and, you know, kind of learned about it. So it was um, kind of like a special assistant role. And I had my hand 
I was really learning more than I didn't have a ton of responsibility. I was just kind of learning uh, which elements I liked. So I did some scouting, I did some player development, I did some op stuff, and then um, made some really good friendships in, in that office with some of the guys. And then um, that summer uh, in August, Coach Corbin called me about this role at Vanderbilt. And, uh, you know, this was what I always wanted. Um, I think if you asked me when I was playing, you know, what is life like when you're done? What do you want to do? Um, I would tell you, I want to be, you know, I want to coach at Vanderbilt. Uh, but I know how hard that is. And, you know, there's only four spots here. And obviously uh, there's not a ton of turnover. And I didn't have any experience. You know, that was a real thing too. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a good conference. So, you know, um, the, the pool of candidates is large. So I never, you know, expected that I'd be able to land this. But, um, you know, I think he, he tried to hire some head coaches, um, you know, mid-majors that didn't really bite. And then, you know, he's like, all right, let's, you know, let's do this. Um, you know, he took a shot. Off. So I'm very grateful for that. That's, that's great. You know, I'm just, as, as you was, as you were talking, I, I remember when I was, uh, when I was in Manhattan, just going back and uh, I had someone advising me at the time and they told me that I should, I should transfer to Vanderbilt and that they could do it. Right. And I was like, okay, like, why would I do that? Well, they're like, well, you'll be playing behind the number one draft pick, which he will be come June. Big lefty. I said, okay, I'm a very loyal person, though, so I don't think so. Well, it turned out to be um, David Price. Right. And I stayed at Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. That was that so, New York pipeline down yeah, in Nashville, yeah. man. You know? Real smart call on my part. No. Um, so, um, so now you're at Vanderbilt, okay? Uh, obviously, Vanderbilt just made the news a, a few weeks ago with with uh, Al Leiter's son, right, pitching a no hitter. How was that? Yeah, he's he's a good talent. He's uh, he's really good. And that was he was pretty uh, pretty locked in for two weeks. And the next week, he came out and threw seven uh, no hit innings in Missouri. So he, um, he 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 was really in a great zone. But he's uh, he's got a chance to go pretty high, you know, this summer in the draft and. Um, hopefully he can just kind of maintain what he's doing and stay healthy and, and keep going. But he's, uh, he's a good kid. He's tough and he's competitive. He's poised. Um, you know, he has all those elements that you look for and, um, that you could dream on and say, he's got a chance to be a very, very good big leaguer. What, what is your actual title? I'm, uh, the recruiting coordinator and, uh, assistant coach. How is recruiting now during a COVID era? Frustrating. <laughs> How does it go? So, so obviously things have changed. I mean, you know, when I was playing, obviously coaches would come out and see you. They'd fly to see you, you know, if you, if you were good enough talent. Uh, I'm assuming obviously Vanderbilt can go anywhere around the country to recruit anybody because that's where you'd, you'd want to end up if you were, if you were a player. Uh, what does it look like now? Well, I'd say the biggest change from when you were recruited and myself when we were recruited, um, the, the process starts way too early right now. Uh, it's very, that's what's so frustrating. Um, I think, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, as an industry, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on kids in freshman, sophomore year of high school to feel like, um, you know, they see their, some of their peers or they see other players like, you know, committing to programs. Um, they put a little bit of pressure on themselves and it really stunts the development of these kids. So it's, it's not good for anybody. Um, and then when you put that into COVID, um, you know, we haven't been out, able to go out and evaluate um, for 15 months now. Um, so I haven't seen a high school game, um, you know, obviously since last March. Now this summer it'll open up. So June 1st, it's going to open. You, know, you can go out and evaluate and watch players again. But, you know, it, it really didn't slow it down for some schools. Um, kids were still committing you know, kids are signing up to go to these schools and committing to them. They've never stepped foot on campus. Um, the coaches have never seen them play. It's, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous, you know. So um, we've kind of put a pause in it. Um, you know, we just want to make sure we get it right. We want to make sure when kids sign up to come to Vandy, they know what they're getting because uh, it's a lot different than what you see on TV. Right. So what, for you, right, what, what was the biggest, what was the biggest jump, I guess, from, High school to college. What 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 was something that happened to you? I guess that 
you weren't prepared for? Like what was different between that jump and, and, and like kind of now for, for the high school player, when they jump from college, uh, from high school to college, what should they be prepared for? Um, probably two things. I mean, you could look at it mentally and physically, I think physically just the strength component, you know, um, I was very undersized personally. I, I find, you know, um, when you look at the top tier of college baseball, um, these are very physical kids. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, young players, um, they can get lost searching for the perfect swing or trying to throw weighted balls, um, you know, to increase their velocity and they don't take care of their nutrition or their, their strength and conditioning. Um, and that's really going to be your fastest route towards development is just physical fitness and strength. You know, I, I didn't lift a weight in high school. Um, you know, I barely lifted them at Columbia. So when I got to Vanderbilt, I was swimming upstream, you know, um, I had a long way to go, um, you know, from the mental side. Um, now I would tell you if I'm a high school kid, um, you got to learn how to win. You got to learn how to play to win. Um, and that goes back to what I was talking about earlier with the, the frustration of recruiting right now is that um, players are playing to be recruited and they're playing to showcase themselves. And that's, that's not desirable um, because, you know, you might end up going to a college, but you won't help them win. you're not going to contribute because, you know, you don't have many kids right now that are talking about winning city championships. You know, um, a lot of times when you talk to a kid uh, on the phone and you say, well, what are you, what are you looking for in baseball? What's your goal? Oh, well, I want to, you know, I want to go to power five school. I want to be all state. And, you know, never once they mentioned like, I want to win a title, you know, um, the guys that come out on the field and play for us are the ones who can understand the value of playing for other people and understand what it's like to put a program first. And like I said earlier, you know, when you're when you treat the game with that type of respect, um, it'll come full circle and, and it will bring you fulfillment and you will maximize your development. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think a lot of young kids and parents feel pressure to strictly focus on, you know, um, the development of themselves uh, as a technical player. And uh, I personally think that stunts your development. Makes plenty of sense. Now, if my if 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 this was not COVID times in, in a COVID era, if if. Mike Baxter, the you know recruiting coordinator of Vanderbilt, showed up to a game. What specifically are you looking at in a kid? What what is gonna what is gonna get your attention for a high school player? Now, I ask because I'm sure there are some high school players on here that are hoping one day to be recruited by someone like yourself. So, what is it that someone can do to get your attention? We watch everything, you know. Um, I it. it the one word that summarizes is just presence, right? It's like, let me put it this way. Like if, if you go to the, you know, you say the angels are playing the Yankees and you're at Yankee stadium and Mike Trout comes to the plate. Like you're not going to go get a soda and a popcorn when Trout comes up, like you're going to watch that's presence. Right. And I think like that summarizes what the goal of the player should be um, when he takes a field, you can't have, presence if you're standing in the batter's box and you're thinking about where your hands need to go and you're like because now all of a sudden I'm thinking about myself I'm not thinking about going out and beating somebody um, you can't have presence if you sit in the dugout and you think to yourself I just struck out I'm over one or um, you know I made an error and now I'm sitting here and I'm just in my, my own space because presence comes from your ability to connect with other people and make people feel your energy so, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, that sounds vague, but it's actually the separator of kids. It's that you should be able to show up at a field. And I think the kids that can impact our program, um, you know, that you want them to have that type of presence. Now, um, from a physical standpoint, um, you know, you obviously need a prerequisite set of skills. You know, you, you got to be able to run. Um, you know, we don't really take on the slow footed big guys. You know, we like athletes. You got to be able to play defense. Uh, our, our program is built on pitching and, and defending, you know, so, um, you know, we like middle of the field defenders. And, um, you know, obviously that goes without being said, you, you got to be able to play. Uh, but there's plenty of players that have tools, uh, but have no presence or they have tools and they don't know how to win. Um, and those are the guys we try to stay away from. Now, here's here's a question, and I'm sorry for scratching so deeply because 
as I said, there is a, there is a difference of, of the kids that are on right now, and this question should make sense. So you talk about presence. How do you separate separate presence in recruiting from flash nowadays? Now, when I say flash, it's that player that certainly looks the part that goes out there is what you said, kind of looks the part to play for himself. How is it that you separate that? Because that person could have presence too, but you know, the sunglasses on the hat, the look, the wristbands, ever everything. No, those are those are the imposters. No, that's not presence. That's imposters, and that's posturing. You know, and actually, posturing is the easiest thing to identify. You know, um, that's the ones that you you really try to stay away from um, because those, you know, it goes back to the rock, jelly bean, and marshmallow, right? You've all heard that. You know, those those guys are you know they're jelly beans, right? The outside is hard, but the inside is mush. You know, um, the quiet ones. Presence isn't about voice. It's not about swag. It's about confidence. It's about competition. It's about engaging in the task in front of you. And it's not just about sports. It's really just being immersed in the task at hand. You know, I think when you see people that are fulfilled in their profession, whether it's baseball or anything, um, when when you're truly fulfilled and you're engaged, you create presence. And you know, great teachers have it. You look around Malloy. You could think about great teachers that you know, or, um, you know, that give that and make those connections with students. And it's genuine, you know, it's not manufactured. And I think it applies in any industry. Um, but when you want to get to the elite levels, the people you get excited to work with, the people you get excited to recruit are the ones that you know, you know, regardless of the ups and downs, um, baseball brings pleasure to this player. Um, you know, he gets fulfillment out of playing. Um, and he's playing to win. He's playing for his team. He's not playing because his dad wants him to play. He's not playing because, you know, he feels pressure to get a scholarship. He's playing because he gets great fulfillment from the game. And he enjoys being around his peers. Absolutely. The game, the game's changed a little bit since you and I were in high school. So yeah, for sure. I want, I wanted to make sure that everyone understands, uh, your viewpoint from one of the best schools, baseball schools in the country. So I appreciate you sharing. Sure. Uh, if you don't mind, we're going to move on to some questions that were submitted by our, our registrants. Uh, one of the questions, John, from the class in 1990, just staying on the uh, kind of on the current topic is, what advice would you give a Malloy Jr. considering college choices and considering to play baseball? Yeah. In, in college. Yeah. The first thing I would tell you is there's a college there's a college to play for. That's the first thing. If, if your goal is to play college baseball, you can make that goal happen. Um, what you gotta make sure you do is find the level and find the program that's gonna give you the experience that you want, that's right for you. Um, when you can put your ego aside as a player and you can recognize that, like I was talking about earlier, you know, it, it's not about you don't have to be a Vanderbilt to be a successful college baseball player. Like it, it, that's not what it's about. Um, it's about the experience and the journey and, and getting a chance to keep playing. And if you can focus on just keep playing, um, you're going to get your fulfillment. You're going to feel good about it. Um, a lot of times people put pressure on themselves to say, I want to be a D1 baseball player. Like that means nothing. You know, it really, it, it doesn't matter. Um, there's tons of great division two schools and, you know, um, junior colleges and obviously D1 schools. And it's all about getting into an environment that fits you, you know? So the advice I would give is to try to get objective feedback from people around you, you know, try to find a coach. Like that's what coach Curran was great about. You know, he, he would tell you, he would shoot you straight. You know, I remember walking in his office and I had a letter from Miami and I, I put it on his desk because I needed him to sign something and write a recommendation. He goes, yo, Miami, you can't play at Miami. What are you thinking about? You need to go to like St. John's or somewhere like that. <laughs> I like, he was right because I wasn't ready. You know, I wasn't. And, and if I went to my, I didn't have the opportunity to go to Miami, but if I did go to Miami, I probably wouldn't have played, you know? So I went to Columbia and I played. And when I was at Columbia, I fit, it was right for me, but I always wanted more, you know, but if I was like a slave to that and I didn't recognize, like I wasn't ready, I would have went somewhere else and sat at the bench and not played. And then it probably would have changed the course of my career, you know? So 
the first thing I would tell you, find somebody that can give you objective feedback about where you fit. And don't take it personal and say, okay, great. All right, now out of this bucket of schools, um, I want to go to their camps. I want to get in front of them, right? I, I don't need to go to showcases and all this nonsense. Find the targeted schools that you like. And then once you know what schools you like for those reasons, try to connect with the coaching staff. And if they have some camps, go to the school camp directly. It's going to show an incredible amount of interest from you to the school. And, you know, recruiting is, it's like dating. I mean, it's a two-way street. So, you know, if you're at a mid-major school or you're at a smaller school and you're finding a good player that has great interest in your program, it's going to spark a ton of interest from that coaching staff as well. You know, so um, don't be shy with your interest in the program, um, you know, and, and don't hold yourself to some standard that you feel like, I have to be at this certain level. I need to do this. No, go to where you're wanted. Go to where you fit. And then be very present when you're there. Learn how to play. And you will get more opportunities if your skill sets provide them. Awesome. Just going back, I mean, we, you and I already spoke and you, you, you addressed it earlier. Um, Andre from the class of 87 asked, what was your favorite or fondest memory of Coach Curran now? You said you don't really have one. It's just that his honesty. And I'm just going to parlay off your story real quick of what you just said about coach and just share something that was very funny that you brought up that I forgot about for a long time. It's 2004, my senior year. I'm already committed to Manhattan. I signed my letter of intent. I'm ready to go. All right. I'm all signed. I can enjoy my senior year. And for those who are our age, we know coach's office where it was across from the locker room. And there was a back table in his office that sometimes you hung out at. There was a couch in his office. And I'm sitting there. We're about halfway through the season. So where, I don't know, it could be May, you know, so on. And there's a bunch of letters on Coach's table in the back in his office. And as I said, it's 2004, and I'm committed to Manhattan. And I see there's a letter. It's from Columbia, stamped on top. Attention, Jack Curran. I'm sorry, Archbishop High School, Jack Curran, attention, Matt Rosati. So I was like, Coach. What is this? He goes, oh, that came for you the other day. You don't want to go there, though. You're going to Manhattan. I said, okay. So I open it, right? And this is God's honest true story. I open it. I'm like, coach, Columbia wanted me. I have no business going there, but I should go there. Why didn't you share this with me? And as I say that, I look at the postmark. It was from 2003. In my recruiting year, he left it and didn't even give it to me. It'd been a whole year sitting on his table. <laughs> I go, coach, you changed my life. I could I could have graduated out of school. He just looks at me, he goes, You didn't want to go there, big guy. Move on. <laughs> True story. That's it's funny that you brought that up. Yeah. Um but just um just some other quick questions. Um Mike from the class 82 asked, how did your experience, uh, experiences at Archbishop Malloy shape and prepare you for the majors and now Vanderbilt, coaching at Vanderbilt? Yeah, I, it, probably more with, um, <laughs> you got me thinking about coach now, man. That's fun. You're, wel you're welcome. Yeah, no, it's great. I love it. Uh, as, uh, so I came back one year and um, I was sitting on that couch you're talking about, right? Yep. And, um, it's probably like, I don't know, 08 or 09 or whatever. And, uh, you know, I come check him and we're hanging out. And he goes, yo, I heard you're dating a carver. And I was like, how did you hear that? He goes, I hear everything. And uh, he goes, look over your right shoulder. And then uh, I looked and it was, he goes, that's her uncle, Bobby. Look over your left shoulder. That's her dad, Stephen. <laughs> that's funny. So I ended up marrying Diana, who... Um, is the daughter of Steve Garver and um, the Carver family is a great Malloy family, but we met at Vanderbilt and um, it, we, you can imagine that, right? We're sitting at a bar downtown and we're putting our paths together and she's like, you went to Malloy? She's like, oh my God. So we started breaking it down. Small world, but of course, Coach Curran um, was all over. You know, he was, he was great. And then um, when I got hurt, when I got hurt in New York, um, and running into the fence, he called me like the day after, and uh, I felt terrible. Uh, I was just sitting in this chair, and he just goes, I go, hello? He goes, yo, 
what the hell are you doing running into that wall? And then he's like, you ever hear the story? And he's named some guy. He goes, he ran into a wall in Montana and he could never hit again. That's coach. <laughs> that was him. Yep. But, um, but what you learn from him, though, like I said earlier, um, I would say I learned, you know, I don't know if it was more about being a big leaguer. Um, I, you know, I took a lot from him from a coaching perspective um, and a teacher because I thought he was a teacher, you know, and I think that's a big philosophy of our program is, you know, we're, we're coaches and titles, but like we try to teach, you know, and that can encompass like the skills of baseball, but also just the life skills. And, you know, I, I don't know how deliberate he was and, you know, kind of building his program at Malloy around that, or if that was just a byproduct of him being a really good person, which I think it was. Um, I, I don't know if it was necessarily like built that way. Um, I thought his empathy for players was second to none, you know, and he, he could walk such a fine line of accountability and love. And, and I think that is where you can really impact young men and young kids or anybody, you know, um, when, when you, when you have players or people that you're leading, um, when you have those people that they know that you love them, but that you're going to hold them accountable. Um, to me, that's the gold standard of leadership. And, um, I was very, very lucky to be around him because he did it so naturally. Um, and that's why so many people loved him. You know, he was such a special, special person. Um, but the simplicity of his message every day, um, there's so much power in simplicity, you know. And unfortunately, sometimes in the modern world of sport, um, people get lost in the weeds of technique and technical status. And, um, you know, Coach, uh, Coach Carr was uh, amazing at, being spot on with simple messaging. And that's why he was so successful. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Now, um, this this question will probably conclude the night. I, I really, I can't thank you enough, Mike, for really, you know, spending the time with us. Um, I, I believe that you offered some tremendous insight to everybody. Just, just, we covered everything, you know, your high school, the big leagues, the minor leagues, everything, you know, you gave us some really, really, great background information that, that, as I said, and I always reference it, that you can't read in the newspaper. So I really, I can't thank you enough. And I'm going to, and I'm purposely leaving the hardest question for the end. Uh, this question was submitted by Paul class in 1983. It says, I know you're a Whitestone guy. Do you have a favorite Cherry Valley sandwich? <laughs> yeah. TCS with bacon. That was my, that was my go-to and I live four blocks from Cherry Valley. So um, I haven't had it in a long time, um, but now that you got me thinking about it, uh, I got to get it back on my list because that, that was money. I, I can, we'll figure out how to get one down to you. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, we just want to thank everybody for taking time out of their night to join us. Um, Mike, again, thank you so much uh, on behalf of, Malloy and President Karsten, we can't thank you all enough for being here. And um, as, as, as we've said, stay tuned. Standard Talks 3 is, is being lined up and planned as we speak. So, uh, Mike, we wish you a great, a great rest of the season, uh, health, and, and we just hope you guys, uh, you guys win it this year. You're lined up, too, so don't, don't, let, don't let me down, at least. Uh, we got a long way to go for that. We got a lot of we got a lot of questions we got to answer here. But um, I appreciate you doing this, Matt. It's uh, it's good connecting. And you know anybody that took the time to be on the call here tonight, um, you know, feel free to just reach out if if I could help you guys with anything. Uh, but I appreciate you guys coming on and, and just talking baseball. It's uh, I always enjoy that. So thank you very much for putting it together, Matt.